Good morning, church family. I hope you're doing very well this beautiful Sunday morning. I'd like to begin with our call to worship from Psalm 77, which is the focus of our sermon series um, today. Psalm 77 is a psalm of lament and it is a psalm of hardship, but in the midst of this, he cracks into his memory of God's beauty and grace in the midst of suffering. And so Psalm 77, verse 11, says this, I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm, you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. What do you remember about God's grace in your life? We are surrounded by hardship of all kinds. And I want to ask you, church family, what do you remember about the ways that God has worked in your life? God has worked. He's worked mighty things, both to save you, but also to redeem you and to make you his child. God has done amazing and marvelous things that if you sit and you think through them and write them down, you remember his holy nature and his wondrous works. You are very loved. And so I encourage you right now, as God's children, to stop and remember with me of the mighty things that God has done so that we might rejoice in his love and light and salvation right now, so that we might worship him, our God who has redeemed us. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time. Please bless our worship. Help us to remember the mighty things you've done. Help us to be sustained by your glory and your power and your grace. I am grateful, Father, that you've given us something called memory that helps root us in hope so that we might not flounder consistently. But instead, Lord, we might have our hope in you, the God who has worked in the past and who will work in our future. Father, as we go into this service on a hard topic in hard times, teach us to lament. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to hurt, but to hurt with you. In that mystery between our hurt and your sovereignty, in that intimate space where we can pour out our entire soul before you, be present with us and teach us to remember when it feels like life is so shaken that we don't know which way is up. We thank you that we can call upon your name right now as your people. So bless our worship time this morning online in your name. Amen.
kid parents. Each week I'm going to send an email with a streamable video and a lesson plan filled with activities to help your family answer big questions about God. 
Clive and Ian are hilarious. I hope you enjoy learning with your kids as much as our CM team does each Sunday. If you didn't receive an email from me, please email me at rachel at manahawkinbaptistchurch.org and I'll be sure to add you and your family to our list. This week, we answer the question, what do I do when I'm afraid? Sometimes when we're afraid, it's because we don't know what's going to come next. Let's take a moment and look at three stories from the Bible of people who were afraid and didn't know what was going to come next. Our first guy was thrown in with the lions. Wait, listen before you get your cry on. God protected him from many hungry, roaring beasts. God prevented them from enjoying a feast. Daniel is the name of the guy who spent the night in the den. God sent an angel to shut the mouths of those lions who roamed the pen. It's time to take a quick trip on a boat with some scared friends of Christ. A storm had begun and tossed them about, so they were shaking with fright. To see the end of this tale, remember we have a great God who controls the wind and the whale. Jesus was sleeping in the little ship when his friends came crying with fear. The Lord commanded all to be still. The storm went still and the sky grew clear. There's one more story to be told, one last clue to show you how God's with us when we are scared and will not leave us then or now. So let's remember one more story before we say goodbye. This story is about some dudes who faced a fire but didn't die. There were three guys who served a king but loved God more than anyone. The king got jealous and prepared a fire and threw them in to see them done. And then the king said, Hey, that's strange. Why are there four guys in that blaze? Then the three came out. They were unharmed and all knew the fourth was God and praised. Good job. You searched and have found that God knows our fear and he still loves. So tell him when you are afraid. Remember these tales and your God who saves. Parents, remember to check your email for more activities and a streamable video so that you can learn more. What do I do when I'm afraid? Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this for the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. 
your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Good morning, church family. I'm honored to be with you this morning and to be sharing in God's word. To get, today we began a new sermon series on the Psalms of Lament, entitled Songs of Sorrow. The book of Psalms is the songbook of the Bible. Its 151 chapters contain a section, sections that will absolutely leave you breathless and filled with wonder. Um, it's like seeing a sunrise from the top of a mountain, so many parts of the book of Psalms. But in the same songbook, one-third, I'm not overstating this, one-third of the 151 chapters are songs of sorrow, anger, sadness, rage, lament, frustration, disappointment, disillusionment, sadness, despair, mourning, loss, heartbreak, abandonment, isolation, bewilderment, and that's just to name a few. It's not just the book of Job that deals intensely with heartbreaking places and goes to hard spots that are gut-wrenching. These psalms of lament go to those gut-wrenching places, and they don't hold back. There are psalms that ask for revenge. There are psalms that reel in the agony of betrayal. There are psalms that deal with sleepless nights where the psalmist openly says, I want to sleep, but I cannot. And these songs ask hard questions like, God, where are you? Have you abandoned us? Are you at work in the world? Now, in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, people are rightly turning to books that are built on answering some of those questions about the sovereignty of God, His goodness, and suffering. Did God cause this pandemic? And is this the result of sin? Is it, in, in what way is the result of sin? Is it judgment? Is it just a natural outpouring of, of the, res, the consequences of sin? And I think these books are important, and I would very much encourage you to find some, like specifically one that just came out by a guy named John Lennox. But as important as those books are, they're not all we need as Christians. We need more than just a theolo theological and philosophical understanding of God's sovereignty, human responsibility, and the impact of sin. I would argue that one of the most important things we need right now is the ability to bring our agonies before God with complete and total honesty. To sit before God in our sorrow, to lay our grief at His feet, to ask Him the hard questions, the questions that cannot be answered. One-third of the songbook of the Bible is about sorrow, agony, anger, rage, and frustration, disappointment, disillusionment, sadness, despair, mourning, loss, heartbreak, abandonment, isolation, bewilderment, bewilderment. and that's, again, just to name a few. And we need to learn to sing those songs before God too, now as much as ever. I don't know what you've been told, and perhaps you have been told that these feelings have no place in a proper Christian life. Maybe you've been told that to have those feelings is sinful and you need to settle down and get it together before you come to God. Get your act together. Maybe you've come from a Stoic background, or maybe you have a Stoic personality or a quiet personality, and the idea of learning how to express this angst before God makes you want to melt into the floor. No one is going to ask you to stand up and weep in public. We couldn't either because, you know, everything's online right now. But the running premise that I want us all to grapple with and to understand and to bring into our Christian life is this. Giving these emotions to God is worship if it's done before him with whatever faith you have giving these emotions to god is worship if it's done before him with whatever faith we have there are sorrows that cannot be given away in any sort of clean manner there are sorrows that journey with us to lament on a human level is simply to agonize but to lament as a christian is to bring one's agony before the Lord of glory with the faith that we have. And we will find, if the Psalms are to be believed, that this is worship that God welcomes and adores. Let's pray together. Father, teach us how to lament. Teach us how to cry. 
Teach us how to be sad. Teach us what it means to be broken. Everything we have is yours in heaven and earth. So teach us how to receive those things before you. In the agony of our hearts, and in love before you, and sometimes even in bewilderment before you. We thank you and we praise you for all the good things you've given us. In your name, amen. Our first psalm to read today is Psalm 77. This is a psalm written by a man named Asaph, who was responsible for 12 songs, as far as psalms, as far as we know. And it was probably put to music by the choir master, whose name was Jaduthan. And it contains the following structure. Verse 77, before we reach the verses, is the inscription. 77, 1 through 3, is, is what would, I would entitle Asaph's Daily and Nightly Agony. And then verses 4 through 9, the worsening trouble, which leads to his core questions. And then 10 through 15, remembering what God is like. And then 16 through 20, remembering what God has done. As we read this, what I want to ask you to do is to see if you've ever agonized in these ways as well. And watch how he turns to God and ask, does it end on a cliffhanger? Psalm 77, to the choir master, according to Jaduthan, a psalm of Asaph. Verse 1, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. And the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Salah. This is where Asaph begins, in the point of agony. Now, I'm sure it starts with a ring of hope. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. Verse 1. But as the song continues, we find that Asaph is really in a hard spot. Verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. What do we have here? We have a person who is presently in trouble and is looking for God. Verse 2, in the day of my trouble, I will seek, I seek the Lord. But he's searching and can't find God. He's searching for God day and night. His hands are up, stretched out for help, nonstop, every moment. Verse 2, in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. But his hands are left empty. Nothing's filling them. But he's, but he's not stopping. My soul refuses to be comforted. The end of verse 2. And when he remembers God, he moans. His heart is in turmoil. And when he meditates which is a word for remembering and considering and deep re reflection. When he meditates on the things of God, his spirit fails him to the point of fainting. Verse 3, When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. And it gets worse from here. Verse 4 and following, You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the days long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger shut up his compassion? Salah. Remember, this is a person writing about his own experiences. So let's be sure that we understood what we just read. The songwriter is in such agony that he's losing sleep. Such agony that he's lost the ability to speak. Verse 4. You hold my eyelids open. 
I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Have you ever lost sleep over heartbreak and agony? Have you ever been so upset that you couldn't hardly speak, if at all? He yearns for better days, days of singing and gladness. He yearns for his heart to be settled. Verse 5, I consider the days of old, the days, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. It's, it's amazing how pain can cause memories to just disappear and flee. Humans have been proven to have very strange memories. First, we don't remember things very well. And the details we do remember, we remember through a grid from a perspective. And yet there are some memories that are rock solid, that go unmoving. Like where you were when you heard that one song that you love. I have an extremely vivid memory from, from when I was in high school. I was climbing up the side of a mountain right as the, uh, as the sun was setting. Actually, I don't even know why we were up there. It was probably pretty dangerous. But we were up there, and as the sun was setting, the world changed colors. And it looked like all the mountains in the Colorado um, landscape were painted with pastels. I remember that vividly to this day. But there are other things that I remember just as vividly that are traumatic that when I think of those things, it's like a knife to my stomach. And what pain and trauma does is it overloads our capacities and it takes a memory, a sweet memory, and puts it far, far away, miles away, remote and distant. Might as well be from someone else's story that you hear at a bar or something. And the painful and tra traumatic memories sometimes feel very, very close. And it all sometimes feels extremely jumbled. And how do you make sense of it? The songwriter wants to sing his old songs. The songs of joy. He wants to ponder in his heart the joyful things. He says in verse 6, Let me remember my song in the night. But what he's come to is an even further agony. An agony that questions the very heartbeat and presence of God. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Verse 7. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger shut up his compassion Salah, hear what he's saying. He feels like God is spurning him. He wonders if God's love has ceased forever. He wonders if the promises have come to an end. Verse 9. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger shut up his compassion? And the capstone of this heartbreak comes in verse 10. Now, the Hebrew here is such that you could take it one of two directions. The ESV takes it a certain direction. But I believe that the New Living Translation offers a better rendition of this passage. And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. And so his agony is complete. And I want to ask you, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that God has turned his anger against you, that he's turned away, that he's forgotten you, that he's forgotten how to be gracious to you, that the promises have expired or are for somebody else. Have you ever felt that at the end of the day, God must have turned his back? There's no way to make sense of this world unless God is not the kind God I knew him to be. You see, when we suffer, suffering automatically calls us to ask those core questions. And the psalmist here is not just ranting. He's asking God if he really is who he says he is. Because in Exodus 34, which is what he's quoting and mentioning here, this is exactly how God describes himself. Exodus 34, verses 6 and following, 
The Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is what God says he's like. And the psalmist knows this and is asking, are you really? Have you stopped? Has something changed on a core level? It's an honest question and it's a good one. You say you're like this, but I can't make sense of this awful world unless, unless I were to find out that you somehow ceased to be what you were. There's no way to make sense of this otherwise unless somehow you've changed. In VBS, one of these past years, we taught the kids this little mantra, when life is hard, God is good. But can you teach that to a child who's being abused or has been abused? Where were you, good God, when I was being hurt? See, the world has been brought into this state of lockdown, of unknown shock and panic and anxiety. People are asking questions about God's plan, sovereignty, the coronavirus, sin. But these are questions that have been asked by the victims of abuse for generations. These are the questions people who suffer from chronic pain have been asking for generations. These are the questions the children have, who've lost their parents since they were young have been asking for generations. These are the questions that war-torn cities have been asking for generations. These are not new questions. They're the same questions for a different time. And society and the church, sadly, has not always been an easy place for the person who's suffering. We would imagine that you are much easier to swallow if you were a put together packaged person. And I'm saying this to you here today. This is a song, a song of agony that needs to be sung by God's people. A song that directly points to God and says, who are you? It's staggering to even consider that God considers this worship before Him. And that God even welcomes us. That God doesn't just zap us to the ground when we have this question. But this, this psalm of lament and many others like it show us that both the question and the one who asks the questions are welcome before God. And God receives it as worship. So who is God? Verses 3 through 6, we find that he's struggling to remember and meditate on the works of God. And then suddenly, verse 11, he begins to break through. In verse 11, we read this. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the, your wonders of old. I will ponder all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeem the people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Salah. When the water saw you, O God, when the water saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The skies poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path of the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Aaron, of Moses and Aaron. When the psalmist remembers the mighty works of God, what does he remember? In this instance, he remembers God's work in bringing Israel out of Egypt. And it's a song, actually it's sort of a remix of a song from Exodus 15. The song that the children of Israel 
sang together on the other side of the Red Sea after God had dramatically brought them through the Red Sea by parting the waters and all these things. In Exodus 15, 1, we read, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed glory, gloriously. The horse and the rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Jump ahead to verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallows them. And on and on and on and on it goes. Retelling of God's glorious deeds. And what we see in this psalm is a remix of this song from Exodus 15, of God's glorious deeds, of the actual parting of the Red Sea, and of God declaring war on the waters himself. And it's really cool because in verses 16 through 20, he takes it a step further and he actually uses God's phenomena in, in nature to show that God is even above nature itself. Verse 16, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trum trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea. Your path of the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of a Moses and Aaron. And in this passage, really cool, I found this out. The psalmist is actually playing against some, some beliefs of the people that were around during the time when the psalm was written. The, these people believed that the waters and the sea and the forces of nature were actually gods in and of themselves. But what happens when the true God of the universe comes across them? He crushes them. They run away afraid. The clouds become like dust kicked up under the God, uh, the God of the universe's chariot. Thunder becomes the very loud sound of his coming. And lightning is used as his arrows. This is what God is like. The, he is awesome in battle. He is holy and strong. And the psalmist is right to remember this in his agony. So that's where it ends. Verses 1 to 10, we have our songwriter agonizing asking the core questions about the very heartbeat and nature of God. Verses 11 through 20, we encounter the very nature and heartbeat of God. But I'm going to ask you a hard question. Does the psalm feel resolved to you? There are times I think I would have read this psalm and be like, yes, it's resolved. He comes away seeing what God is like. We have a question. Here's what God is like. Boom, resolved. But I don't think that anymore. Instead, I think the psalm shows us very important clues about what it means to lament as God's people. The first one is this. Lament isn't always resolved. In the beginning, he struggles to remember and meditate on the nature and character of the Lord. And he eventually gets there but we don't see him coming back and extolling the Lord's goodness and answering his own questions. We don't see him say, no, the Lord will not spurn me forever. He's favorable. His promises are not at an end. He has not forgotten to be gracious. We don't see that. There are Psalms in which that happens, where he, the, the ending teases up and finalizes all the questions in the start. And we'll see those if we have time. What we see is him finally breaking through to remember God. We see him see God's awesome works. We see him remember God's holy character. But we don't see resolve. And that's okay. See, worshiping God is not about getting where you need to be. It's about being with God where you are. Prayer is not about getting to where you need to be. It's about being with God where you are. And if you're coming to God in a place of brokenness, you can worship and find God there in that place of brokenness. And that's considered worship before God. God wants to be with us where we are. He doesn't need us to put on airs and to dress up 
and to play nice and to act like we have our act together. He wants to be with us right where we are. And if you are lamenting, or if you have an ongoing lament in your life, and if you are lamenting, and if you have an ongoing agony in your life, one that doesn't get teased away neatly, you're in good company. The Bible itself shows that this kind of presence before God is a worship that God receives and adores. It doesn't have to be neatly packaged in order for God to adore it. And you don't have to be neatly put together in order for God to receive you in that space between the agony and the answer. The second thing we learn from Psalm 77 is the importance of memory. We are people who struggle to remember the things we should remember, but it's important that we do. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 12 and 13, and then several other passages after that, the children of Israel were called to make monuments to set up and certain yearly actions in their rituals as a means of reminding themselves about their history. And the children, when they saw these things, were supposed to ask, or eventually as children ask about everything, why are we doing this? And the parents were supposed to tell them the mighty works of God. And thus, in retelling them the mighty works of God, they would instill in their children God's favor and God's and belief in the God who was at work in their behalf. Otherwise, they forget. And you forget. And I forget. We forget everything. We may feel like God has forgotten to be gracious to us, but very often, one of the things that we need to do is remember how God has shown His grace to us, and not just in our lives. We need to see it in the world. We need to see it in our family, in our community. We need to stop and take hold of what's real and what's true. Memory serves us for our good, to remind us that God is at work, to remind us that God has been at work. Friend, in your life, there are places in your life where God has shown His marvelous work in massive and in awesome ways. Take the time to remember. Yes, those memories might be interspersed with hard and painful memories, but don't let the hard and painful memories cause you to forget the ones where God showed His might in your life. Because He has. And He hasn't just shown them in your life, He's shown them in the world, and especially in the scriptures, we see the very mighty hand of God at work. Cling to the memories of God's work in your life. And the final clue that we see from this is that our memory is a clue of how God is at work in our lives now and will be tomorrow. Memory shows us that what God did yesterday, He will continue to do in our lives. We have a God who is the same yesterday and today and forever, and He's made us great promises, and He's kept those promises in the past. He's keeping them now. He will keep them from all time. And memory is one of the ways that we remember not only what happened, but we start looking in the future and see what will happen as well. There's a reason verse 20 ends like this. The whole section ends like this. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Here's the psalmist is asking, where are you? Have you forgotten to lead us? Have you forgotten to do what is right? Have you forgotten to show forth your, your mercy and your love? And he ends with a memory of God leading his people. And he's, the general call of this is to say, because God did it in the past, he can do it again, and He will do it again. The grace of God displayed in the past shows us His nature and kindness and wonders then, but it also shows us what God will continue to do now. You have a God who hasn't forgotten how to be gracious. He knows how to be gracious, and He is gracious. And so in the midst of our agony, we may not know what tomorrow brings, but we know the one who held yesterday. And so we can imagine with hope, what He will do in the future too. You have a great and awesome God. Friends, my call to you today is to take the words of Psalm 77 
and rewrite them for yourself. Rewrite them from your own story. Maybe you're not worried about God's forgetting to be gracious or anything like that. Maybe your worries are somewhere else. Ask them pointedly. Ask them with honesty. You were in good present. You were in good company. Because one third of the songbook of the Bible is filled with songs just like yours. And guess what the Lord does to people who come to them, come to him in his lament, in their lament. And guess what the Lord does with people who come to him in their lament? He receives them. He welcomes them. And he is with them in that space between the agony, the mystery, and his glorious answer. Let's pray together. Father, teach us to lament. Teach us to cry. Teach us to cry out to you the groanings of our heart. Father, I think about my church family. Even though we're apart, and we all have now the shared agony of watching the coronavirus change our world, there's even more things happening. We live right now in a world where domestic abuse is higher, children are afraid and living in homes in which they're afraid, people are facing joblessness and no incomes. Father, and if that weren't enough, then there's all the other things that we have already to worry about. Father, we come before you. Sometimes it feels like we call out to you and we might as well be shouting at birds in the sky uncaring and unchanging. Sometimes it feels like you're obstinate towards us, that when we ask you to come close, you instead just look at us from afar. And, and sometimes it feels like everything that we do is just another lesson re repackaged. Oh, I hate that lie. But I've believed it, and I continue to believe it. Father, sometimes it feels like you just don't have an answer for the suffering of this world. But I pray, Father, that you would teach us how to lament, how to be with you with our agonies and our frustrations. And Father, for everyone here who feels like this surely cannot be true and this is disrespectful to God to come to this, please lower their guards so they might have you invade. And for people who've been seeking to put on a face and come across as this put together Christian or have been seeking to hide and not be known, would you help them? to lament, help them to come before you and to agonize and to cry and to lay before you all that dirt, all that hurt, all those places of questions so that you might be seen as glorious in their lives. And Father, while this psalm doesn't resolve, I pray that you would show forth your glories and grace by helping us heal. I thank you that you are a God who works mighty things You've worked it in the past. You'll work it again. Now show us your glory in your name. Amen. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves where oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, you sovereign be my God, where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never fail, and you won't start now, and I will call
call upon your name Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. My trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine
church family coming at you from my backyard with my dog Mary and we're gonna do announcements together ain't that right Mayor? the first thing I want to share with you is thank you the online giving and the giving that you've sent in to, to the church family has been absolutely incredible I know a lot of nonprofits and a lot of churches are really struggling during this time and it has been incredible to see how you the people of God have uh, stepped up and made sure that our church can pay its bills. What an absolute blessing. As it is right now, we've applied for some of the stimulus grants that the uh, government has offered, and we'll see how that turns out. And uh, we'll let you know if there's uh, anything more to be shared about that. But as it is right now, we are able to pay our bills and to keep our staff employed. And so thank you for doing all that work for our church family. The next thing is we're looking to uh, continue providing N95 masks and nitrile gloves for our first responders. If you have a stockpile of gloves or N95 masks that you either have on hand and are unused, or maybe you have a pile of them somewhere, please let us know so we'll come pick them up from you or you can drop them off at the church. We'd like to get those to the first responders. And thank you to the family that reached out this past week and donated a whole slew of N95, I mean, of nitrile gloves. Stafford police received those and they were very, very grateful. Finally, continue to let us know how you're doing. On the, in the description is our comment card. Let us know how we can support you and lift you up before the Lord. Let us know what you need. It would be, it's our honor to pray for you. And I know that there's a lot of uh, questions on there, but we really wanna know and keep a bead on what's happening in our church family. Uh, it matters to us if, if you're facing unemployment, it matters to us if you're facing job loss uh, or financial hardship. Let us know how we can support one another during this time. As always, if you need anything at all, please reach out to us. It is our honor and our privilege to serve you and to pray with you. And I thank you for walking alongside us in this unbelievably weird time. Also, be praying that we can figure out online discipleship and how to do business meetings. We have some ideas, but uh, we want to make sure that they're clear so that everyone can participate. Thanks so much for being with us. And uh, now let's get to the benediction. As we draw this service to a close, we return to Psalm 77. If you are broken and hurting, if you have had sleepless nights and nights filled with sorrow, if you've asked those core questions or are now be finding that you need to give voice to those questions, know that you're safe. And when you give these things to the Lord with whatever faith you have, God sees this as worship. And this is a place where he can visit you and be present with you in the midst of your suffering. Psalm 77 shows a God who declares war on, uh, de declares war on nature and with nature. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured, forth, poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. The path was through the sea. Your path of the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Those were very real, even though it was done poetic, poetic language. The oppression and the trouble that the children of Israel were facing that was stuck in poetic language here was very, very real. And see how great our God is by comparison to it. So much so that the troubles that Israel was facing fled away. Your God is with you. Even though it feels like the world itself may be falling apart, your God is with you. So I encourage you, friends, lean in to the memory you have if you are filled with sorrow, if your agony has taken and swept over. You have a God who absolutely loves you and is absolutely present, and he will show forth his kindness and goodness to you and all that you're doing. And I pray that the Lord might show his grace to you as you lament with him. Learn how to voice your hurt before him. Let's pray for you. Lord, 
We bless these people before you, wherever they are, if they're scattered in their homes and in isolation and working in first line, front line jobs and, and restaurants and, and service industries. Please protect our people from the sickness. But also, Lord, please help us to bring our hurt before you as we experience it. We thank you that you are not a God who is afraid or shoes away anyone who's hurting, but you bring them and invite them yourself so that you might heal them. So heal us, Lord, in our agony, in our sorrow, and in our lament. We thank you for the welcome that we have into your presence when we are hurting. And we ask that we would come into your presence with joy as often as we hurt in your name. Amen. Have an amazing week, my friends. We love you very much. If you need anything at all, please reach out, and we'll see you next week.